All right, Elizabeth is joining us. Uh, hello, Elizabeth. Hello. Steven is here, Radica is here. Um, we're just waiting for Gihan to join. Uh, Alex will not be able to join us. some paper noise, Eugene. Yeah, here, if you could put yourself on mute, uh, uh, you know, and mute yourself and you will speak up, but maybe by default, put yourself on mute, please. All right, yeah, I'll, I'll just give it another minute uh, for Gihan to join in the, in the, and then we'll start. Uh, we are missing Yuja. I'm going to give him a call really quickly. Okay, um, yeah, sounds good. All right. Uh, okay, so so Gihan is here. Hopefully, uh, Yuja will be able to join us when she can. Uh, let's kick off. So, uh, Team uh, Cyber Tiger Security, uh, welcome, welcome to the final interview. Um, congratulations on making it this far. You know, top three teams. Uh, I must say that the team, that the judges were very impressed and just so that you guys know, uh, you really dominated this competition. Uh, you know, the gap between in terms of your ratings and the second team is big, right? And, uh, you know, five out of seven judges gave you the first place during the, pre you know, when we looked at your presentation, right? So you, as I said, you dominate the competition. Um, but today is a test of something else, not just your analysis, but also how you're going to present and how you will be able to, you know, present your recommendations to, to the board. Um, so um, my name is Eugene Levin. I'm the competition organizer. 
um, I've been involved with the chapter of uh, uh, ISAC New York Metropolitan Chapter for about four years. I've been uh, in charge of academic relations for two years, and then I was a corresponding secretary for two years, and now I'm running to be treasurer. Um, uh, the first judge that was supposed to ask you the first question, Alex Bazai, is not here, so I'll kick off with the first question, So, uh, which is this one. Can you give me a very quick summary of what happened in terms of the case study uh, and the first four inserts, injects, right? Maybe three to five minute summary. Hey, uh, I can take care of that one. Um, so first off, I just want to say um, my name is Vincent Poblete. I'm Cyber Tiger Security Acting Leader. I just want to thank everyone um, to be part of this interview because it means so much for us to be able to present to you all. Um, we're, we worked extremely hard to make this happen, and I couldn't have been pleased more to have every single one of our team members a part of this project. Um, and their in-depth knowledge really pushed us forward. And as many of you guys may know, a great team is what makes a leader flourish. So I'm, I'm extremely happy to have them. Um, so let's get right in. Um, so currently we are two weeks from the large breach and PHI uh, theft inject and Pharmaco was last at a place where they were facing um, website, website instability and they suspected malware and malicious code to be the cause. Um, it was confirmed that over 200,000 uh, PHI records were stolen and Pharmaco was in a state in which their severe data breach was costing them millions already. And to top this off, the data breach and the merger had already been leaked to the public and it negatively affected Pharmaco's share price and their reputation. Um, during this time, Pharmaco has maintained control and they were slowly working through all this chaos with the board and trying to keep everyone updated and um, implementing suggested plans. Um, and we now stand two weeks later in Inject 5 where our suspicions were confirmed and the cause was due to a third party website vulnerability due to a failed software patch. Um, from what we know, the malware has spread to Pharmaco's information systems and we have an estimated cleanup of three weeks. And in regards to operation, there has been a blockage to ship products and it's affecting Pharmaco's ability to process any additional orders. And it's currently being addressed by continuing operations for vital medicines only. Um, because of this, lawsuits and regulators are coming forward to penalize Pharmaco's mishap even further, um, and it's increasing the cost of the breach. And through this all, public relations are being handled by the CEO and are following our suggestions to keep the media updated and continue to stress the importance of recovery to maintain confidence in Pharmaco's reputation. So there are a few, a few points to cover here, including steps to recovery. So uh, I want to pass it off to Yevgeny, um, part of our technical team. Hi, uh, so I'm Evgeny. Uh, I'm a student at Baruch College, acting as the technical analyst for Cyber Tiger Security. Um, and uh, in terms of recovery, there is uh, quite a few factors in how to maintain um, maintain uh, a good uh, standing between uh, the technical side and also the PR. So uh, th there's uh, there's a there's a few recommendations that Cyber Tiger Security has, which can uh, benefit um, the PR side and also moving uh, forward as a uh, company that took and took this as a lesson um, to improve uh, future f future operations. So the main thing is, uh, in order to uh, effectively recover here. Um, we recommend things like uh, comprehensive vulnerability scanning, uh, employee training, and also having an IT steering committee for better allocation of uh, cybersecurity budget and communication between business units. Um, we also heavily recommend um, doing things like uh, incorporating the latest technology, including machine learning. So machine learning is a key thing that um, can help identify network traffic patterns under normal conditions, and that can be used to visually represent abnormalities in the network. Um, this helps uh, improve the NIST framework in all aspects, so it helps us uh, develop the identify, protect, and detect um, parts, and uh, including responding. So we have processes that uh, must be carefully implemented to uh, to respond to these 
uh, abnormalities. OK, I think that, that might be a good place for me to, to jump in. Um, Eugene, if you don't if you don't mind, th 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 thank you very much for that. And it's a this question I have is related to the to in inject inject number five. So and I'd like to, to kind of ask this question in, in, in two parts um, with respect to your technical recommendations. So obviously there is. You know, a, a web vulnerability at the third party, as was uh, well described by by Vincent, um, but there's also um, technical limitations that are occurring, which impeded the operations of, of Farmco, which is also correctly stated. So can you provide two distinct recommendations that you may have, one on the vendor side or addressing the vendor vulnerability, and then another related to the business operations of Farmco? So yes, um, uh, my, my fir uh, our first recommendation um, would kind of tie into both. Uh, it's to be have better uh, vendor screening. So um, implementing a due diligence uh, process and when you're choosing a vendor is key to determining whether they're going to be a good fit for the company. Um, developing a, a, a good due diligence questionnaire is also very important um, to ask the right questions. Um, and then, uh, as I said, uh, the other recommendation, which is key, is to make sure you're taking advantage of the latest technology in the industry, which would be um, machine learning. Um, there are providers out there now who uh, offer excellent services uh, that could provide uh, visual uh, representation of uh, how your network is functioning. Um, it could be used to uh, get, a, get a, an idea of uh, normal operations and then um, uh, show you ab abnormalities and you would need to develop processes of how to handle those abnormalities so you can block um, block suspicious requests you you can um, deceive them uh, or you can take no action to see if you uh, if you think there is an, an attacker has a, uh, a a sophisticated plan and you kind of want to get more information about what they're going to do uh, in order not to kind of uh, give away your cards, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, those yeah, are just just the one last last piece. I mean, you're, so what you're describing are, are pretty good or you know, fairly good detective measures. Um, of course, this is this is that's always after the vulnerability has been exploited. Um, I'm curious, you know, what your front end uh, recommendations might be. So in terms of front end recommendations, as I said, uh, a good vendor screening processes um, uh, and that would help you determine that the vendor themselves also have uh, good practices in place to protect you and your services. The second thing would be um, to have a good process in place to do uh, vulnerability scanning. Uh, so there are plenty of uh, penetration uh, testing techniques and and um, uh, um, I apologize. Um, when you offer the community to test your website for penetrations and you offer them a reward, um, those are also good ways to keep on top of those uh, kinds of bounties, things. Bounties, yeah, yeah. Bounties. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Thank you, and and you know I think we can we can move on to 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 David with some more pointed questions on the legal side. Go ahead. David. Oh, okay. <laughs> David Chang here. Okay, one of the internal auditor for MUFG Bank, which is the uh, the older name for Bank of Tokyo. Okay. First of all, uh, good job on the initial presentation. So I'm going to switch topic a little bit less technical, right? A little bit more on the legal side. Now, given the the various inject from one to five perspective, in in as a consultant capacity, what do you think the potential legal implication I mean? What law or regulation that they have may have breached? And on your consultancy recommendation perspective, how does Knowing if there's any law and regulation bridge, how did that affect your recommendation for the merger and acquisition? Um, I can answer this. So uh, first I'll introduce myself. 
I'm Victoria Becky. I'm a third year uh, computer engineer at Stevens Institute of Technology. Thank you again for having us today. So in terms of uh, Pharmaco's operating countries, uh, they operate in several countries all over the world. Specifically, their personal health information records would, presuming that they are HIPAA compliant, be only in the countries where they have active research and development going on. So that'll be the countries of the United States, Canada, Mexico, the UK, and China. Each of those countries has their own laws regarding data privacy, especially with uh, sensitive information, including health information. So in the US, we have HIPAA, we have uh, the FTC Act and the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. So HIPAA uh, requires that Pharmaco have certain administrative safeguards so that they are reasonably protecting PHI from any intentional, unintentional use or disclosure that violates certain standards that HIPAA sets out. And they also must reasonably protect uh, protect PHI to limit the incidental uses or disclosures um, that would happen uh, during a permitted or authorized disclosure or use of that information. So perhaps that could be uh, spillage when someone's transferring information from one party to the next within the company for company purposes there could be some vulnerabilities there that need to be, again, reasonably protected against. Um, and so if Pharmaco is not, uh, does not have the appropriate uh, safeguards in place, or if they've been negligent in any way in terms of, you know, reasonably protecting and safeguarding that PHI, they could open themselves up to civil liabilities under HIPAA. And then even more or furthermore, in subpart D, uh, Pharmaco has certain breach notification requirements that they need to meet. Uh, so if the breach or sorry, the Pharmaco must notify each individual whose PHI was compromised uh, no more than 60 days after the breach was discovered, or if they have reason to believe that PHI might have been compromised, even if they don't have proof that it was compromised, they still need to notify uh, anyone who could have been affected within that time window. On top of that, if the breach uh, involves more than 500 residents of a particular state or jurisdiction, uh, Pharmaco must notify prominent media outlets serving that area within 60 days of discovering the breach. On top of that, since the breach has involved more than 500 individuals, we're looking at 200,000 PHI records. Uh, Pharmaco has to inform the Secretary of Health and Human Services, again, within 60 days of the breach. Um, furthermore, there's also the question of how, is there any liability on the side of the website uh, service provider since they are since presumably a, a lot of this could have prevented had they made sure that the software patch was successful um, if they did not inform Pharmaco of the breach that they experienced again within 60 days but preferably as soon as possible then that also opens them up to some uh, civil liabilities and then any delays in reporting beyond what HIPAA specifies. So if there's any reason why uh, any of these companies must wait longer than 60 days to make these disclosures, it has to be because the uh, relevant law enforcement officials specified in writing that they should delay that kind of public statement. Um, if, if I could um, just piggyback off yeah. that. Um, so our team's recommendation is to really put together a legal team as um, Pharmaco's assets are, you know, um, worldwide, which means putting together a team and being able to tell the board what they're looking at um, can give them a, a good mind on 
what they what the cost may be in terms of the legal side. Um, a lot of different countries have their own regulations um, and with lawsuits coming in, it's important to be able to kind of sort through this and explain to the board and explain to everybody, hey, this is the fines and these are the regulations that are happening and what we're currently facing and this is what we need to implement moving forward. So definitely putting together a team and um, notifying everything that this this needs to be pushed forward um, mm -hmm. because it's very important and we want to prevent any future fines or any um, more um, any more regulations that they could, that pharmacal could possibly breaking because um, it is like a, it's it is a time issue and you know two weeks later they want to mitigate um, the risk of uh, further further cost. Yeah, so is it I, then, Sorry, sorry, Victoria, go ahead. Yeah, and then to to I guess finish out what uh, Vincent was saying. Yes, so in addition to you know HIPAA, as I explained, again with the different uh, laws that apply to different countries, um, they have a lot of similarities, but they do have some differences. And so having legal teams specifically that can evaluate each country's laws and potential violations, um, what are the potential penalties for Pharmaco, being able to get a handle on that. And then after, after having estimates, um, then making an de informed decision as to, you know, whether or not Pharmacquire should go through with the merger or should wait and see what happens in terms of the fines and potential settlements. And then, um, seeing where they can go from there. Great. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Vincent. It was very clear. Thank you. Uh, you the next one. Yeah, uh, Barry. Thank you. We can't hear you, Barry, for some reason. Some... Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. I am the president and founder of Atlas Cybersecurity and the co-executive director of the American Cybersecurity Institute. And I have the privilege of serving with Eugene on the board of uh, New York Metropolitan Chapter of ISACA. Thank you guys. Uh, you've been doing a great job. I've really enjoyed the presentation and your answers so far. I'd like to ask you some more questions about the legal side. Uh, what liability might accrue to PharmaQuire if the acquisition of Pharmaco does go through? Uh, currently, we are unsure about that. Uh, since Pharmacquire has no, I guess, known problems with their uh, cybersecurity or data protection protocols that we know of, we don't expect any new liabilities for Pharmacquire. In terms of accepting a merger, if the merger goes through too soon, Pharmacquire may have to absorb uh, at least some of the penalties or liabilities um, simply because they will now be the, the owner of Pharmaco who is liable. If I could jump in a little bit, if that's okay, Victoria. Um, Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name's Elizabeth. I'm also a third year student at Stevens Institute of Technology. Thank you guys for coming out. Um, so if, Pharma, when, if and when PharmaQuire absorbs PharmaCo, um, you know, the liabilities that they would inherit, inherit would it be different from the current ones? Uh, you know, there would always be the risk of um, moving information from PharmaCo's like servers and websites onto their own to make sure that those leaks and breaches don't happen again on their new information. Um, and of course, if they absorb Pharmaco too early, like Victoria said, they could absorb some of those liability costs from uh, lawsuits, legal fees, um, et cetera. Um, yeah. Great answer. Do you have any thoughts on what might what possibilities there might be for structuring the acquisition uh, and merger in such a way as to mitigate the potential liability for 
for Maguire? Uh, yeah. So uh, historically, when companies have had uh, cybersecurity breaches before a merger or acquisition, that typically puts them in a place of disadvantage and their bargaining power decreases. Um, like uh, with Verizon and Yahoo, the price for the Yahoo assets dropped considerably. Um, so Farm Acquire could leverage this cybersecurity breach into, into bartering for a lower merger price, acquisition price, uh, which could help cover some future costs. Um, that's, that's, I believe, the main point, unless anyone wants to add. Um, I can, yeah, I can. Go ahead. I can add in some more, I guess, uh, technical and legal side. Um, again, waiting to see how the dust settles, to see what kinds of penalties do come up or what kind of uh, civil charges might be or civil claims might be brought against Pharmaco in order to quantify the, the financial risk because a lot of this is presumably still under investigation and we don't really have numbers. So seeing how all of that shakes out before making a definitive decision is advised. Um, and then in terms of the actual merge protocol, we would recommend a, a softer transition where um, not all of the data is moved onto Farm Acquire servers servers or services all at once. Um, we have, you know, I guess blocks or chunks of data moved one at a time under uh, careful watch by um, CISOs and other uh, information security specialists to make sure that there's no uh, spillage and to make sure that everything is secure every step of the way. You, John, you, you, uh, you, you wanted to add anything? Yes, I, I want to share a few points on um, um, for for Mr. Band and uh, question for the acquisition structure and during the case study on uh, competition um, analysis, uh, I did some research in regards to the type of acquisition available in the market. Although I'm not the expert in the acquisition, but I do find there are different type of acquisition that will actually impact the consequences of the results of the merger or acquisition. So I believe um, if farm acquire wants to limit their liability and in the unforeseen future because of this cyber incident happening in farm acquire farm acquire, um, I will find actually I, I will actually do more research and compare which acquisition structure is more uh, is safer and. Uh, provide more benefits to farm acquire and at the same time also able to help uh, pharmaco um, mitigate uh, current um, cybersecurity uh, risk and also um, successfully have two business um, merge together and have a brighter future and also rebuild the reputation. That, that's my thoughts for the acquisition. Great. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll pass it to, to, to Radhika. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Radhika Bajpay here. Really, congratulations, first of all, to the team for being here today. I think awesome job <laughs> so far. Uh, my question is around uh, top two or three recommendations, right? Like given there are, uh, especially in current market situations, there are like oftentimes security teams have to deal with uh, budgetary constraints. So if you would have to pick like across all the technical and non-technical recommendations that you have provided for this, if you would have to pick your top three, if you could explain to the board what those top two or three would be and your rationale for picking those. Uh, I like to share one. Um, I think it's most important when I look at the case study, um, the company is multi-billion dollar company and it doesn't have the IT steering committee, if I'm not wrong. I see other committees like for HR and uh, um, 
different departments, but then there's no IT steering committee. As you know, the IT steering committee is very uh, important for large company because um, they they have the budgets to have one, and then it's really beneficial in the long term because uh, it helps um, the IT units have a better communication and collaboration with other business units and also they they uh, with the better communication they will be able to um allocate um be better resource and uh, more probably more cybersecurity budgets to to better protect the business as a whole and also um have always have the IT department and the cybersecurity team always work on the project and prioritize the projects to align with this business uh, objectives and goals. So that's why I once recommend the company to establish or the farm acquire will after acquisition will have a um a, have a complete IT steering committee that will take care of the whole business. And of course, um, that also involved the uh, change management management. That, that's what I learned from my uh, IT audit class. And um, because the company, two company, they have acquisition or merge, there are always some change in every department so that we need to um, uh, work on the policies on the change and change managements to um, better develop the IT strategic plan in the IT steering committee. That okay. That's that. Sounds good. Any any other recommendations? Yes. Um, like I was saying earlier, um, I recommend Pharmaco invest in. Uh, developing their monitoring uh, solutions. Uh, so utilizing a service like Dynatrace, which has uh, an AI engine called Davis, um, which supports anomaly detection, or a service like Splunk, which is a security and observability tool, which uses AI powered features. Um, I think that th that would go uh, a long way. And uh, from, from the perspective of uh, PR, if Pharmaco shows that they're taking advantage of the latest technology to fix their mistakes, I think it could be well received. Uh, and to then, sorry, um, oh. to, to piggyback off that, um, it's extremely important for reputation to to invest into creating a response plan and updating the public about the most recent and most active situation that Pharmaco is facing, you know, uh, companies, they spend millions of dollars in advertising. It's not for no reason. You know, uh, it's, it's extremely important for them to convey to the public that they're doing everything that they can. Like um, this is due to a third party um, mishap and to paint that story to let the public know that Pharmaco is working through this and this will be able to kind of keep their partnership and keep their consumers coming back. Um, and conveying that they are that stable company that they were even prior to the breach. And then I guess one final uh, recommendation would be, uh, well, we have to consider also the, the human side of all of this, where uh, we had a breakdown in communication between the company leadership and the IT department, which uh, led to email theft that could have been avoided by setting up uh, more secure private channels for discussions of the potential merge. And we had the employee that uh, shared PHI over email in an unauthorized way. And so those kind of events can be prevented simply by, you know, having all employees uh, complete some kind of cybersecurity training module uh, during their onboarding process and then regularly, maybe once a year in order to keep themselves up to date. Um, and there are some uh, paid licenses available for company use, usage, but there's also um, 
there's also a great simulation available on the Department of Defense Cyber Exchange, uh, which is very comprehensive in terms of talking about phishing, talking about um, how information can be unintentionally or intentionally leaked or spilled, and basic information safety protocol. Great, I think, thank you. Thank you for mentioning all great points. And I think all of you are spot on there. Like it's all about people, process and technology. So I think all of your three recommendations make sense. Uh, I will hand it over to Gehan for the next sets. Thank you, Radhika. Hi, hi team, congratulations on making the finals. Uh, good work, good uh, team, uh, teamwork there. I see everybody kind of speaking up and that's always good to see in these events. A uh, little bit of an introduction. My name is Gihan Dabre. I uh, lead the identity and access management function for CVS Health. I'm very happy to be part of this uh, uh, this event, uh, partnering with Eugene for about four years now. So, quick question for you uh, on um, on crisis management, right? Uh, what are the most important elements in your view of crisis management and in protecting the company's public image? in this type of situation? Um, what do you prioritize? Why do you prioritize it? And what are your thoughts on it? Um, so, um, like I said earlier, um, it's about really the communication between um, everybody part of this um, mishap. Um, the number one thing is people are going to start panicking, and if they don't know what's going on, it's going to lead to even more damage. So number one is communication and letting everybody like getting everyone on the same page. Um, that was the most important part because the, while at a looking at this at a high level, there's just so many moving parts. So um, number one, getting the board involved and then translating that to the public. Um, so, so definitely, you know, creating a response plan uh, is definitely one of our suggestions as you know, addressing the legal side, um, addressing the the evaluating the IT security and, and like further building out the company's IT team um, would be the correct steps in trying to help Pharmaco um, segue into the right direction. Uh, if I could add uh, one of the most important things in like a PR response is to make sure it's comprehensive and it's cohesive everyone is moving on the same page and you're giving the same um information uh the, the, the worst thing for pr is if you have two upper level management people giving different information uh very close to each other um so it needs to be a united front in order for the message to be clear to all the stakeholders involved whether that's customers employees or vendors um as we uh, saw in the uh, one of the injects um the Pharmaco stock dropped. So clearly they lost trust from their customers, from their vendors, um, and they just need to gain that back. And you gain that back by being consistent and by updating those affected, uh, you know, as soon as possible, giving them accurate information and continuing um, that good communication throughout the entire process. Uh, losing trust is really, is a really bad thing for a company because it can take a while to build that back but it's, it's not impossible. It just takes consistent work. Yeah, good, thank you. Eugene, how are we tracking on time? Do you want me to go for another one or are we good? Uh, maybe we can, we should move on to Rohan. We have uh, like six minutes left. So let's move on, let's proceed to the next. Hey, thank you team. Hey guys, my name is Rohan. Um, I'm the director for systems engineering at Fortinet. So um, I have two questions. I'll just uh, you know fold it into one. What do you think is the role of uh, cybersecurity insurance company in deciding for these customers on what technical solution they need to implement so uh, so that we can you know prevent such breaches? As I mentioned, I think that that uh, the best um, solution would be utilizing the latest technology in the industry, uh, which in my opinion would be something associated with machine learning and AI. Um, and that would 
probably be adequate for a cyber insurance company uh, to accept uh, as a as an acceptable preventative measure um, that allows the company to monitor their um, exposure uh, online. But but do you think cybersecurity insurance plays a important role? for the companies to make decision on which products to buy or which uh, solutions to implement. Are you saying how, how much the cyber insurance company should influence? Um, no, I mean, do they influence? Not how much they influence, but do they influence? Do they influence? I would um, ask maybe Elizabeth and Victoria to chime in. Um, I believe you guys had a point. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll step in here. So it's with any insurance company, the insurance company wants to see that uh, the the party that they are insuring is taking at least reasonable steps to prevent and mitigate unnecessary damage. So having, uh, I suppose, an audit or some kind of investigation when considering whether to take on uh, a new client or when considering, I guess, how much should Pharmaco, for example, be paying into insurance, uh, that's definitely going to influence uh, Pharmaco's practices. Uh, companies generally want to decrease uh, their costs wherever possible. So if that means putting in more preventative measures, so that way they have to pay a lower price for insurance, uh, that is probably going to be effective. Um, in terms of whether or not companies actually adhere to that, well, we do have uh, the, the breach incidents at Pharmaco. So it's possible that either the measures that they took were lacking or uh, non-existent. And so for that, I guess we would have to have more information to say uh, really how much the, the insurer kind of affected their practices on that front. Cool, thanks. Uh, very nice breakdown of the answer, Victoria. Cool. Um, I think I will hand it to Eugene. You're on mute, you're on mute, Eugene. Oh, sorry about that. So we still have a little bit of time, so I'm going to ask one more question. So I was just curious how you guys collaborated as a team. Um, did you, when you came up with your final recommendations, were there any dissenting views or did you come like with com consensus and everybody agreed? Or was there any disagreement within the team? Um, um, oh, do you want to go, Vince? I just wanted to say that, uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, Vince to thank for aligning the entire team. Uh, I think that that was our biggest uh, asset in this in, in terms of that. Um, he organized uh, all of our ideas in such a way where we were able to collaborate um, and assist each other in making points that maybe one has missed. Um, it was it was kind of beautiful to see that kind of uh, feedback uh, from each member in, in in things that you know uh, you may not specialize in. It was um, it was it was a it was a good time. I remember towards the beginning when we were first all getting used to the content of the case study, we were having some disagreements on whether we did recommend a that they continue with the merger acquisition or not, um, and it took some you know the dissenting side and like the pro side and the anti side, you know, we each would bring our own perspectives and we would discuss it and we would discuss it. And we, we did come to a conclusion and we all have a united front because of the evidence of the other side and our, uh, you know, good like academic discussion, we were able to convince the other side. Um, but it was, it wasn't difficult to work with each other, but um, you know, the me and Victoria go to a different school than Yuja, Yugeni and Vincent. So most of our meetings were restricted to text or Zoom call. Uh, we did a lot of those, but it worked very well in the end, even though that distance can make it hard. Um, to chime in, um, 
it was it was a really great team. Like the big part about it, and I guess being part of piecing everything together while everything is going on is being able to know like, hey, who are you? Everyone has their own experience. Everyone knows something. So it's like being able to kind of piece that together and then fitting into the project is extremely important. So especially when now where we weren't able to meet in a consistent um, basis, it's like, hey, I need you to get this done. Can you do it? And I wanted to make it very clear that, hey, if you need help, or if you don't know what's going on and we want to double check people's work, um, that we're all on the same page. And the big part about this was it's a learning experience. So we need to kind of dip in, dip in and out of our, our own kind of like work to like spread our knowledge about the cybersecurity industry. Sounds great. Well, to my uh, terrific performance, uh, thank you very much for participating in the competition. I sincerely hope you'll come back next year. Uh, tell your friends about it, so hopefully they will join you for next year. Uh, um, I'm hoping to get back to you within less than a week with the final results. And, uh, you know, again, hopefully it was a positive experience with you. Sounds like it was. And um, I I'm glad you were a part of it. Can I also thank you guys for volunteering your time and actually realizing this thing um it's such an amazing opportunity for uh personally um to have been exposed to this kind of uh project because it gave me a, a really different uh visual perspective of like what i'm getting myself into going into cybersecurity. um i don't think that would have happened uh if it wasn't for this so thank you awesome. i want to thank you for the opportunity um it's like um, there's no um, requirements to join this competition. So um, as an entry level uh, student, I, I will be able to uh, voluntarily um, join this competition and start learning much more than uh, what I can learn from the class. And in my own pace, actually, I learn more, to be honest, because um, when I do research, I find other interesting part of the cybersecurity field, and I spend extra time in the bathroom, on the sitting on my <laughs> car. I read all these doc documents and articles on my own because I'm self motivated. I trying to um, be responsible and show the accountability to my team and try to help um, the as team as a whole to um complete the case study in the best way possible. So I think this um, competition setting is really good for every student to grow their um, you know, future career. Thank you. All right, awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, judges, if you could stay behind for a few minutes, I would appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you for your time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.